Welcome, friends. Thanks for joining us for worship on this Christ the King Sunday. We appreciate you joining us in our online worship. We'd like to remind you that next Sunday begins the season of Advent, and we will have our usual Advent candle lighting service as part of our worship, and we'll be asking some families within the congregation to light the candles as usual, but we will indeed still continue to be meeting only online for safety in this pandemic time. So plan to join us for the Advent season online. I'd like to thank you for your continued support of the work and ministry of this congregation. Your financial contributions are very much appreciated and your generosity has been um, just stupendous. So thank you for that. We continue to receive pledges for the 2021 budget year, calendar year. And if you have already submitted a pledge, thank you very much, we appreciate that. If you have not yet pledged and would like to, but you need a pledge card, contact the church office, just give a call and leave a message if no one is in at the minute, and we'll be sure to get a card to you. Be assured that no one but our financial secretary has any access to those figures that you submit on those pledge cards, so um, you submit them confidentially. And let's get to the good stuff. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we are your children. We come to you needy and worried and stressed. And we trust, holy God, that you are carrying us in your strong and loving arms. So we pray this day that through your Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts and our minds to you, that we might receive clarity and wisdom. Help us to release all of the stresses and worries and challenges that we tend to carry with us all day, every day, so that we can focus for this time on you, what you have done for us already, what you promise yet to do. And help us, holy God, to develop a deeper and more loving relationship with you. We ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
holy and gracious God. You are generous beyond measure. You have created not just this earth on which we live, but you've created the entire universe, expansive beyond our imagining. And Lord, you have, from the very beginning of time, you have given all that we need. You've created a world that, that provides us an abundance of good things. Merciful God, we admit that we do not always approach our days with the gratitude that we ought to have in our hearts. Some days, Lord, we, we observe what we have and how our lives are ordered, and we simply want more. We want something better, something bigger. And Lord, we pray that you would would tune our expectations and our hopes. Remind us, gracious God, that our needs are really quite simple. Holy God, help us to be joyful and happy with less material goods. Help us to focus on what's really important in our lives. As we gather this week and celebrate Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving day that will look in many of our households very different than it has in years past. Remind us, gracious God, that even if there are fewer people around the table, that we still have much for which to be thankful. We pray, Lord God, that you, would, that you would help us to observe practical and safe, safe ways of gathering and celebrating. Merciful God, at this, as we celebrate in this pandemic time, again, remind us that it's the simple things that count. Lord, we pray for all of our, our medical personnel, emergency and first responders, for folks who are working in our hospitals and clinics, those who are registering people, those who are cleaning, those who are providing food services, our nurses, doctors, technicians, physicians, surgeons, Merciful God, protect them. Keep them well and strong physically, but we pray as well that you would bring them the kind of peace and comfort, the understanding of the importance of what they do, and help them to feel our deep gratitude for the sacrifices they make to keep us safe and as well as possible. Merciful God, we pray as well for those who are suffering with the COVID virus. We pray, gracious God, that you would bring healing and strength to those who are struggling and bring comfort to families who have, and friends who have lost loved ones. Merciful God, give us wisdom. And we pray that you would give us as well a strong constitution and a spirit of determination that we might do what is necessary to stop the spread of this virus. Remind us, gracious God, that a small bit of inconvenience on our part may very well save the life of another. Gracious God, we are, our lives, our whole lives are in your hands. And we thank you that you approach us always 
with mercy. And we ask, Lord, that you would that you would inspire within us that same spirit of mercy and compassion as we live our lives with those in our communities. We pray, gracious God, as the certification of our presidential election is approaching, we ask that you would grant us peace in this nation. Lord, help us to come together, remove the divisiveness that has marked our communication with one another. And Lord, we just pray that now more than ever, you would give us eyes that we might see others with the eyes of Christ with the spirit of love. Gracious God, more than anything, we want to be your faithful followers. We want our lives to reflect the work, the ministry, and the mission of Christ. We want, when others see us, to see not so much us, but Christ within. So we pray that you would give us strength and wisdom and courage to meet the challenges that each new day brings. Lord, we're so grateful for your presence, for your prompting, for your forgiveness, your guidance, and your leading. Make us teachable. Make us receptive. Give us ears to hear always your word of truth and encouragement. We ask it in the name of and for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Spirit from creation's birth. Give 
again from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. We'll be reading verses 31 through 46. This is a familiar story from Jesus. Hear the word of our Lord this day. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
Friends, today we celebrate Christ the King Sunday. It's the last Sunday of the Christian Church's liturgical year. As you likely remember, the church year does not follow our calendar year exactly. Our church year begins with the first Sunday of Advent at just the time of year, well, in the Northern Hemisphere anyway, when the days grow short and the nights grow long. It seems fitting, doesn't it, that in the midst of the cold and darkness which surrounds us physically, we would remember how the people of the earth waited in darkness for the coming of our Savior, our Messiah. So at the end of the church calendar year, on Christ the King Sunday, we take this opportunity to remind ourselves not only that Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, but we take the opportunity to remind ourselves as well of just what kind of a king and what kind of Lord is this Jesus of Nazareth. So I want you to think to yourself, ask yourself, what comes to mind when you attempt to describe or define what it means to be a king? Each of us might come up with something a bit different, but I would venture a guess that your various description would have some very common elements. A king should be strong and powerful. A king should have something of a regal or dignified being. A king should have a royal bearing, right? A king should be able to protect his people, his subjects from the danger of marauding armies. A king should earn and or command respect from people both inside and outside of the kingdom he rules. A king should rule his people with both authority and kindness. A king should be wise in the ways of military strategy, in the ways of commerce and economics. A good king will look after the welfare, the well-being of his subjects and protect them against outsiders who would seek to do them harm. And a great king, a really astounding king, will not ask too much in the way of taxes from his people. We Americans haven't forgotten that lesson from 250 years ago, have we? In fact, a really extraordinary king will be very generous with his subjects, sharing with them sometimes the great wealth that he enjoys. Okay, well that's a pretty decent running start, right? I'm sure I missed a detail or two that may have popped up in your minds, but we get the general picture of what a good king looks like. But I have a question for you now. Are you beginning to get a sense of the dangerous ground that we're treading on this Christ the King Sunday? We are dedicated to the truth and the certainty of Jesus as King of Kings. And yet the way we describe a great king is frankly anything but Christ-like. We say Jesus is king, but when we read about him in the Gospels, it appears that we're observing a king who is not at all king-like, not at all concerned with wealth and military might, not at all concerned with people's loyalty even to a particular nation. What kind of a king doesn't care if you belong to the correct political party? Well, to be perfectly honest, we should have expected something like this from our Messiah. The prophet Isaiah warned God's people long before the baby Jesus came onto the scene that the coming Messiah, the coming King of Kings, would be from humble origins. He warned us, Isaiah warned us, that very few people would recognize him that this king of kings would in fact be a suffering servant. But people still wanted, oh, you know, more. They wanted a Lord whom the whole world would look at 
and respect. You know, a king who would strike fear into the hearts of his enemies. They wanted, frankly, a king that had enemies. They wanted a king who would take up the mantle of their own enemies as his enemies. They wanted, frankly, someone who would go to war against the rest of the world on their behalf. It's funny, isn't it? Or maybe it's perhaps more tragic, really, that we can identify so clearly the character flaws in others that we can't be bothered to discern in our own selves. Which brings us right back around to today's passage from Matthew's Gospel. There's a recurring theme in Matthew's Gospel which pops up in today's reading as well. The theme of judgment. John the Baptist introduced that theme in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 3. Repent, he said, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And in chapter 19, the rich young man asks, asks Jesus flat out, Teacher, what good deed must I do in order to have eternal life? We all want to know the rules, right? We want to know what's right, what's wrong. Give me a checklist, please, so that I can track my progress. How will God judge me? On which list will my name appear? Naughty? or nice. I want to know which list I'm on. I want to have some control in this whole judgment process. I want to make sure that the scales of righteousness tip in the right direction for me. So Jesus says to his listeners, which includes us today, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations, all people will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, since we all know that the position of favor is to be sitting at the king's right hand, we know that's where we want to be. So we want to be counted in with the sheep, not the goats. This is what we know about human beings. We all want to know the requirements to pass the test. What do we have to do to be counted in with the sheep? We don't want to know the requirements so much because we want to please Jesus, as because we want to save our own skins. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said that this whole question of what do I need to do is mostly our, our attempt to establish what we don't need to do. In other words, we want Jesus to establish for us the bare minimum requirements so that we don't waste any energy doing any more than we absolutely have to do. In our passage today, this what do I need to do question is phrased in a little different manner. It sounds like this. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? And when did we see you needing clothes or sick or in prison? Now those on the Lord's left hand, the goats if you will, ask the question rather like an accusation of Jesus. Well, if we would have known it was you, Lord, we would have offered food and water and clothing or other assistance. If, if you would simply have revealed yourself, we would have treated you right. Do you notice how their failure some, somehow becomes Jesus' fault? On the other hand, those on the Lord's right hand ask, a nearly identical question. They admit that they didn't recognize Jesus in the stranger either, but they see it as their own shortcoming. When did we ever do anything for you, Lord, they wonder. We didn't even see you. 
So both the sheep and the goats are asking the same question. Both groups admit that they did not see Jesus. But one group acts out of self-interest and the other acts out of mercy and joy. Hearing this passage, we will likely hear the Beatitudes ringing in our ears. Blessed are the merciful. Those who will sit at the right hand of the king are those who have shown mercy without having counted either the cost or the reward to themselves. They have not calculated whether the work of their hands will earn them a place of honor in the Lord's kingdom or not. They've not calculated whether their good works are required by the Lord or not. They have simply shared themselves and their resources with those who were in need. Jesus doesn't speak here in this passage. He doesn't speak about any confession of faith. In fact, both the sheep and the goats call him Lord. The dividing line of judgment here is not one's claim to know the Lord or to not know the Lord. The dividing line seems to be the mercy or the lack of mercy with which one has lived. The church, the community of Jesus, is reminded in this passage to be constantly moving outside of ourselves. We're reminded that we do not, we do not somehow hold or constrain Jesus within our walls, within our doctrine, within our programs or purposes that we establish. Our Lord, our King, will never be constrained by our own small vision of what he is about in this world. Nor will our Lord, our King, ever be constrained by our own ideas of what a proper King looks like. Christ, our King, is the humble servant King who seeks to lift up the lowly, to strengthen the weak, to release the captive, and to set the prisoner free. And he lets us know that this surprising and freeing truth, this is his truth. If you want to go where he's going, if you want to be a part of his kingdom, you'd better hop on the mercy train. Amen. Darkness veils his lovely face. 
beloved of God, God's own chosen, adopted by our Lord into God's family, joint heirs with Christ of the kingdom. Go this day in peace, walk in the mercy and the grace of our Lord Jesus. Be blessed and be a blessing. Go in peace. Amen.